Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. In this video we will start a new unit called Electrostatics and the first topic is Coulomb's Law. Before we get into the details, let's look at an overview of what we will be studying in the next few videos. Broadly the topic is called Electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is the study of electric and magnetic forces. Historically they were treated as separate things because they had to do with different objects. Electric forces arise whenever you took two objects and you rub them together to transfer charges from one object to another. For example silk in a glass rod. Magnetic forces were as a result of compass needles and pieces of iron and other specific magnetic materials. So they were treated as two separate entities. But later on experiments by people like Faraday proved that they are in fact part of the same thing which is now called electromagnetism. In fact electric forces can create magnetic forces and magnetic forces can create electric forces. So this is a pretty broad topic and we will study it in separate parts sequentially and the first topic we will study will be electrostatics. This is the unit we will be starting right now. It has to deal with only electric charges but electric charges in a very special case that is the charges stationary or static that means the charges do not change their position with time they do not have any velocity or acceleration if this is the case then all the electric forces will be constant they will not change with time and that is called electrostatics after that we will broaden our horizons a little bit and move on to electrodynamics in this the charges are not stationary and whenever electric charges move they create what is called an electric current. So in electrodynamics we will actually deal with currents that is, that is charges moving from one place to another. For example charges moving along a wire. Then we will move on to magnetism and the first topic we will study is magnetostatics. Now just like electric forces are created by electric charges, the magnetic charges which create magnetic forces. Magnetic charges are in fact created by what are called current loops. So all we have in terms of the fundamental entities are electric charges and when an electric charge moves along a wire in a circle for example, it constitutes current that is moving around in a loop. And each current loop in magnetism is an analog of each electric charge in electricity. So magnetostatics has to deal with current loops which are stationary. The charges are still moving in a loop but the magnitude of the current is the same with time and the direction is not changing. Here the direction means the orientation of this particular loop is not changing. For example if it is in this direction then it will stay in this direction. We will see that in detail later on. Anyway, so when loops are stationary that is the analog of electric charges are stationary that is called magnetostatics. And finally we will combine all of this and we will get electro electromagnetic theory. There is no specific analog of electrodynamics called magnetodynamics because the moment you start talking about changing loops there is a very small step from going there to combining all of these together into electromagnetic theory. So that's where we'll jump from there. Let's look at electrostatics now. The first topic of electrostatics and the topic of this video is Coulomb's law. This is one of the most fundamental laws of electromagnetic theory and it tells us the force with which two charged particles attract each other. So let's look at a few basic properties of charges before that. We have two kinds of charges, positive and negative charges. Right. Now there is no such thing as a positive charge or a negative charge in nature uh, and what I mean by that specifically is that a plus two units of charge is not more than minus two units of charge. Right. So plus and minus do not measure magnitude. It is just that we saw that there were two different types of charges. So we decided to call one type of charge a positive charge, another type of charge a negative charge. If it turns out that there were in fact three different types of charges, we would have had to come up with some different scheme. In fact, when you start studying modern physics in higher uh, detail in higher physics, then you will look at quark theory in which you have three basic charges. 
right anyway for now we have two different types of charges one type of charge we'll call positive the other type of charge we'll call negative and the basic property which is observed experimentally observed is that like charges repel and unlike charges unlike charges attract right so we have let's say two positive and a negative charge so these two charges will repel each other so this charge will experience a force towards the left due to this charge this charge will experience a force towards the right due to this charge these two charges will attract each other so this charge will experience another force towards the right due to this charge and this will experience a force towards the left due to this charge and of course these two will attract each other as well but the magnitude will be smaller so this is the first experimentally observed fact that like charges repel and unlike charges attract the next important fact to consider when looking at charges it that is that charge is quantized Quantized means it occurs in discrete packets. You can only get a certain minimum amount of charge. You cannot keep splitting it further and further to get smaller amounts of charge. So the smallest unit of charge is called an electron. It also happens to be a particle which is in an atom and it orbits the nucleus. But that particle has the smallest possible amount of charge that we can ever observe. Till date we have never been able to observe a charge that is smaller than the charge of one electron. The SI unit of charge is coulomb and the charge of one electron in terms of coulomb is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulomb. So it's a very very small charge compared to standard human units of charge right. so if you look at an object which has a charge of let's say one coulomb that means it has approximately the inverse of this that is approximately 10 to the power 20 units of charge by the way electron has a negative 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 and proton is the positive one that is the opposite of this it has 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs of charge right so an object which has one coulomb of charge will have 10 to the power 20 units of charge that is a lot of units right and when you have this many numbers often quantization can be ignored right so when we'll deal with actual objects which attract each other we'll not focus specifically on whether or not the actual number is an integral multiple of this because usually the number will be large enough such that it will be an integral multiple of this if you want an analog of this you can think of it in terms of this way water is actually quantized right you the minimum possible amount of water you can have is one molecule of water right h2o you cannot have anything smaller than that but because a glass of water has approximately 10 to the power 23 molecules of water when you pour water from one glass to another you don't see it as being quantized and you know that any time you pour a certain amount of water from one glass to another the amount will be an integral multiple of the unit of one water molecule right so similarly water is quantized but we don't see it charge is quantized but we won't see it because the unit amount of one unit of charge is very very small right another important property charge is always conserved right that does not mean that the number of protons or the number of neutrons will always be conserved you have seen reactions in nature in which protons plus electrons form neutrons plus some other particles which you don't need to worry about the important thing being that this has a plus one charge this has a minus one charge a neutron has zero charge and all the other particles have zero charge as well so particles can shift from one to another but the total charge in the universe or the total charge in any nuclear reaction has to be conserved charge is always a conserved quantity right so this tells us a little bit about the properties of charges now look, let's look at the actual numerical value of coulomb's law uh, if you were to write it in terms of words coulomb's law were to state that if you have two charges let's say the first charge is q1 and the second charge is q2 right 
the the direction of the force between them is already decided by the principle that like charges repel and unlike charges attract coulomb's law tells us the magnitude of the force between two charges and for the sake of convenience let's say q1 could be either positive or negative so we'll incorporate the charge into the value of q1 as well if q1 is 2 that means it's a positive charge if q1 is minus 5 that means it's a negative charge right so what coulomb said was the magnitude of the force mod f which I'll just simply write as F for now, it is proportional to Q1. Right. Let's, for in the figure, I'll just draw it as an attractive force. But if F turns out to be negative, then it'll be a repulsive force. This is just drawn for showing it on the diagram. So as Q1 doubles, the force between the two will double. If Q1 becomes one fifth of its original value, the force will become one fifth of its original value. Similarly, F is proportional to Q2. And finally, F is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So it is proportional to the charges, but as the distance between the two charges increases, the magnitude of the force decreases. As the distance becomes infinity, the magnitude of the force becomes zero. Right. So this, these three rules can be combined into a simple equation. F is equal to K, which is a constant of proportionality. Q1, Q2 by R square. And this is Coulomb's law. The value of K in terms of the other SI units comes out to be 9 into 10 to the power 9. I will not write the units, you can work them out yourself. Right? So it's a pretty large number. So we see that even if we have a 1 Coulomb charge and another 1 Coulomb charge at a distance of 1 meters, then those two charges will repel each other with the force of 9 into 10 to the power 9 newtons because SI unit of force is newtons which is a very very big force and usually charges of micro coulombs that is 10 to the power minus 6 coulombs which is a micro coulomb even those charges are enough to actually move everyday objects like pieces of paper one more important thing which you'll see the importance of this later on when you move on to Gauss law right now it will just seem like a little bit of terminology is that sometimes we use the constant K but sometimes we use another constant of proportionality which is called epsilon naught and the relationship between them is K is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught right so from that you can get the value of epsilon naught and it comes out to be 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12 makes sense k is very large so epsilon naught has to be very small right so this is just two different units i could have instead of k i could have used uh, alpha q here or any random constant right the important thing is this is something which is a constant we can you call it k or we can call it something else whose value is equal to 1 by 4 pi k right which is epsilon naught epsilon naught has a special name and it is called permittivity or free space this name will not make sense to you right now but when we move on to actual current in materials this will make a lot of sense because we will see that every material has its own permittivity and this is the permittivity of space free space that means these two charges are kept in a vacuum right so just to recap two charges q1 q2 will attract or repel each other with a force that is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught or k q1 q2 by r square right now this can be written in a more convenient form especially for us since we are familiar with vectors in which we can incorporate the direction as well so if we write it like this the direction of the force is in the direction of r where r is actually i'll write it down r unit vector is the position vector of the force experiencing particle with respect to the force exerting particle if you remember this then you can keep track of the direction as well so for example if you are looking from the point of view of q1 then this will be the r vector 
the magnitude of r vector will be the distance between them r and this is the direction of the force experiencing particle q2 with respect to the force exerting particle q1 so that means the force which q1 exerts on q2 will be this where r cap is this direction so if q1 and q2 both are positive we know that the force on q2 will be repulsive so this will be positive if q1 is positive and q2 is negative then r cap is still this direction so we see that the force is in the opposite direction that is attractive so this vector equation actually helps keep track of the magnitude as well as the direction if you remember two things one that q1 and q2 could be positive or negative second r cap is the position vector or the unit position vector of the force experiencing particle with respect to the force exerting particle i really really hope that none of you at this time has been confused by my use of r cap r cap is nothing but r vector by r right i could have written it in another way i could have just simply written r vector by r q right so r cap is just the direction and if you're familiar with vectors this should not be confusing to you if it is i suggest you revise that once this complete coulomb's law in the next video we'll start learning electric field but i just want to say that the topics we'll study now coulomb's law then electric field then electric potential energy these should be very familiar to you because we've seen a similar routine when we've studied gravitation in fact a lot of the formulas and a lot of the concepts which we'll study now will be similar to what we've studied in gravitation simply because the actual equation is very same is very similar right in gravitation you have f is equal to g m1 m2 by r square it is proportional to the mass and it is proportional to the inverse of the square of the distance here is proportional to the charge and inverse to the pro proportional to the inverse of the square of the distance right the only difference is that there is charge and here it's mass and another difference is that gravitational force is always attractive whereas electric force can be attractive or repulsive another way of saying that gravitational mass is always positive whereas electric charge which is the analog of gravitational mass can be positive or negative right thank you